Okay, hello everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here for this Tropical Fruit Tuesday. My name is Jeff Wasileski. I'm a commercial tropical fruit extension agent for Miami-Dade County. And today we're going to be talking about freeze protection of tropical fruit crops in Florida. Not easy to do, but I'm going to give you a couple techniques that will kind of help you out if you want to do it. Um, I come from UF IFAS and UF IFAS uh, from the University of Florida has an extension office in all 57 counties. Uh, so we also have in, in Dade County down here in Homestead, we have the Tropical Research Education Center. So we're re really lucky to have that. And there, there's a tropical fruit specialist, tropical fruit entomologist, there's a plant pathologist. So there's all these people that have all this great information. And today I'm kind of passing along some information. I'm extending it from Dr. Jonathan Crane because a lot of these slides today come from him. So you're getting some quality information. So this is Tropical Fruit Tuesday, cold protection. In October, we're gonna be doing tools of the trade. Today, this is a new Tropical Fruit Tuesday and October will also be new. So that'll be kind of cool. Those will be the 24th and 25th unique Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. And then November, we're gonna do all about avocados and December, we're gonna take a break. So here's all the different Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. Uh, there's gonna be a survey and a quiz at the end. So you're gonna be asked all of these and they're all on YouTube. That's why I'm showing them to you. If you go to YouTube and type in to the YouTube search bar, Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, you'll find all of these. So I always like to start with where should I get information? Today you're here to get information, uh, but where are some other places you can get it? A really great place is called Ask IFAS, used to be EDIS. So if you search Ask IFAS, you'll find a search bar like this, what can we help you with? If you type in um, mango, you'll get a 17 page document called Growing Mango in the Home Landscape. That'll tell you cultivars, how to plant, disease, pests, uh, give you a chart of when to do pruning, when to fertilize, how much to fertilize. So very good information there. It's all peer reviewed. So you can't just get it there. It has to go through stages of people looking at it and make sure it make sh making sure that it's quality information. Uh, besides UF, you can look at other universities by searching your subject with EDU. Uh, YouTube, obviously a great place. I've had a couple people in the last few days tell me they went to YouTube to learn some things like pollinating and known or passion fruit, things like that. Uh, Master Gardeners, I know I saw at least three master gardeners online today. So thank you guys for being here. Great source of information. Uh, plant clubs and societies, another good place to get information. You can join a rare fruit council. Uh, you can join the tropical vegetable and fruit society of the Redlands. They meet once a month. There's a native plant society, orchids. They meet once a month and they uh, have experts in there. They have people that talk. Uh, social media. Another great place to get information. So uh, obviously, and number one place is your own garden or your own growth. You need to be walking, you need to be looking, you need to be learning in your own garden and growth. I will purposely plant things here at Extension that I have no idea how to grow them so I can learn about them. So that's a good place for you guys to learn. And finally, uh, beware the source of your information. Uh, Jorge has chimed in in the chat. He's always helping out. So he has another one, the South Florida Palm Society, another um, place you can join. And we love our palms. So first, we're going to start with some cold tolerance. Like how low can we go with some of these uh, um, species? So Adamoya, right about freezing. Avocado, you have the three different races. Mexican is more like the Haas, it can get a lot lower, but it grows more in Mexico and California. We can grow it here, but it doesn't produce well, but it can obviously take more cold. The Guatemalan and West Indian, 
uh, 25 to 28, 25 to 30 degrees. Banana under 28, you're going to get death, but sometimes they just die down and they'll come back from the roots. Uh, Carambola, mature, 26 to 28 degrees, and young, 27 to 32. And this is something you'll see, the older the tree is, the lower the temperature can get without damaging or killing it. Uh, guava, mature, 25 to 26, young, 27. Jackfruit, a little higher, below 32. Key lime, uh, 32. Tahiti lime can get lower, 22 to 30. Longan, um, lower than I would think. It can get to 24, 28 on the mature trees. Loquat, this is one that goes way up the state. When they're dormant and they're not pushing out leaves, they can get down to 10 degrees. Uh, and when they're fruiting, 27 to 28. Um, so lychee, mature, 25 to, or 24 to 25, the young ones, about 32. Mame, 28. Um, papaya, gonna be higher at 30. Passion fruit, 30. Uh, Jorge put breadfruit, about 50, but still a bit delicate if not protected. Yeah, breadfruit is one that if you're going to grow it in Homestead or Miami-Dade County, you're going to have to have some more cold protection than what I'm going to show you today. They grow it at the Fruit and Spice Park, and it is inside of a protected area where they can close it up and they can turn on a heater. So uh, gonna be tough. They grow it down in the Keys though, pretty successfully. Pomelo 32, Sapodilla 26, Spanish Lime 32, Star Apple, that's the Caimito uh, 29, Sugar Apple 28 to 29. So you're seeing they're all kind of just below freezing. And our idea with what, with the water, um, trick I'm going to show you today is to keep the stem or the leaves right at 32 using uh, irrigation. And white sapote 24. So factors affecting the susceptibility and recovery of tropical fruit crops. So we have all these factors like that it's not just um, the cold. So genetic predisposition. This is like uh, what Jorge mentioned. Uh, the breadfruit. So the genetics there are not going to be good for cold. Uh, the site selection. If you are on the south side of a big lake or a lake, you're going to be warmer. If you have just a bit of a slope in your yard or your grove, the lower area, even if it's a foot lower, is going to be colder during a cold event. So think about that. Don't plant in the little, the little down spots. Uh, the vigor and health of your plant, your tree, is, is, is it healthy? If so, it's going to do better. The stage of growth, if it's putting out new leaves, it's going to do worse. If it's more dormant, like we try to get our mangoes and our lychees going and our avocados going into the winter, not just for cold protection, but also to get them to be synced for a good bloom. Tree age or size, bigger the better, older the better. Uh, environmental stresses. If they are, if they're way overwatered or way underwatered, that would be something. Um, high fertilizer rates, too much fertilizer, you're going to push them and cause them to grow. Uh, put out new leaves, and that's not what we want going into the winter. Same thing with pruning. If you prune too late, not only are you probably going to mess up the blooming cycle, but you're going to force out new leaves. When you cut a branch, it wants to put out new leaves. And when that happens, those new leaves are really susceptible to cold temperatures. And then irrigation and drought, the depth and duration of the cold temperatures. So if we just hit 32 for an hour, not as bad as if we hit 32 for eight hours, or if we get it two nights in a row. And that's the last one, the number of freezing events. And freezing events typically come in twos. So here's just the same things kind of uh, laid out. Papaya versus avocado. Avocado can go a lot lower in temperature uh, for genetic predisposition. Site selection, 
when you look at your new grove or your new plantings in your yard, you need to think about that. Uh, plant vigor and health. Non-growing trees withstand more cold for plant stage of growth. Tree age or size, older the bigger the better. Flood stress prior to freeze stress, you have more damage. That's number six. Um, high fertilizer rates and poor timing. They're more susceptible to cold damage, so don't push your plants, especially going into the winter. The time of pruning, again, you prune too late, you're going to get it to put out new leaves. Lack of irrigation, or uh, you're going to be um, damaging the plant. Depth and duration of cold, like I said, number of freezing events. And finally, I didn't mention this before, improper use of or breakdown of cold protection system. So if you're running irrigation, and I'll tell you why that will work, if you're doing that to protect your grove or your one or two cold sensitive fruit trees, and then you suddenly can't water anymore, your irrigation stops or your pump stops, then you're gonna really freeze everything even worse. So how do you monitor? You have many different things at your fingertips. Really good ones are NOAA. Um, that's really good one to, to get into. Fawn, that's University of Florida. That's all throughout the state. We have one right down the street at Trek at the Research Center. Uh, so you can get real-time information there. They also have a lot of tools in both of those where you can do more than just get, get the readout of the um, temperatures. Uh, you have radio, telephone, TV, the web, and private services. In your grove, in your home, you should have a thermometer in a little wooden shelter, like just a small little wooden shelter. Um, and you should have that thermometer because it over at Trek, it may be 34, but in your house or in your grove, it may be 32, and that's trouble time. Um, so know all these ways to look for the temperature. But the best one is to actually have a thermometer where you're at. And you're going to have to be out there in the cold. So if freezing weather is on the way, what do you look for? Uh, in advance of predicted cold weather, we're going to get one or more days when the temperature does not exceed 65. Days when the temperature is at or below 60 at 3 p.m., this is danger if that happens. Uh, we experience two or more days or nights of cold but non-freezing weather, especially if they're accompanied by wind. Because what could happen on the third night is that wind goes away and then we get what's called a radiation freeze where the, air, the, the hot temperature just goes up. And then uh, I'll show you what that looks like in a few slides from now. Uh, if you get snow cover over the Northwest, Midwest, and Middle U.S., beware, because that could push down to us. And if the forecast calls for a low nighttime dew point and temperatures below 30, the dew point usually tells you how low it will go um, earlier in the day, but that can change. That could get lower, so be, uh, be aware of that. So... Advective freezing weather. What is an advective freeze? This is where a large cold air mass brings freezing and sub-freezing temperatures, but they're characterized by windy conditions. So this is a freeze that has wind to it. So the heat is, is, is removed from objects by the wind. This is more difficult to protect your trees because we're protecting you typically using irrigation. And if you have wind, that, that wind kind of pushes the irrigation in the wrong spots, and it can also make it uh, very, very cool. So here's what it looks like. You have the heat going up, and then it's just blown away by the wind. And then usually on the second night, you get a radiation freeze. And you can get both in the same night if the wind kind of blows all the, the clouds away and then it opens up. So radiation freezes happen when there's little or no cloud cover. 
and little or no wind. So if the wind just drops, but all the clouds go away, then the heat just goes straight up and there's nothing to block it to bring it back. So that's a radiation freeze. Typically you'll get that on the second night. So here's what it looks like. Everything just goes up, heat loss from the ground and everything else. So what about methods of cold protection? That's why you guys are here. We talked about site selection. There's another thing, pre-cold irrigation. This is something you can't do the day of or even probably late in the day before but if you can do it two days before the cold event, the freezing event, this will really help. So what you do is you just water the, the, the ground really heavily. You water the ground around your trees and in your grove, you turn on your irrigation and you just let it go, go, go. And that water will hold heat and then it will let that heat kind of rise up. Uh, but you can't do it the day in the morning of and you can't do it like the shortly the day before. Soil banks, you're pushing up soil next to the trunk. We can't really do that because our soil is, is rocky. Tree wraps, I'll show you a tree wrap. Tree, tree cover is very difficult to do. Uh, they used to do down here fuel heaters, but those were diesel kind of a mess environmentally. Uh, irrigation, we're gonna talk about that. Mist systems, wind machines, this is something that is done in citrus areas and further north, but we don't do that. A little further north, you also will get ditch flooding where they have the trees up on mounds and they just flood next to it to get that warm water and have the heat. Uh, and then you have a combination of both of these. So if you had a combination of like a tree wrap with the irrigation, that might be your best way to go. Uh, so the pre-freeze irrigation, which I talked about, water has a high capacity to store heat. So this is done several days prior to the freeze event. And the greater the growth surface and area irrigated, the greater the soil heat storing capacity. So you want to go big or you go home. So tree wraps, they only delay heat loss. So they're not going to be something that completely protects your tree throughout the night, no matter what. But if you dip down to 32, only for two hours, that might be enough to protect your tree. But if you dip down to 32, 30 uh, for eight hours, then it's only gonna delay heat loss for a little bit, but it's not gonna do it throughout the night. So it should be used in conjunction uh, with irrigation. And you should use material with high insulation value. Fiberglass insulation might be the best way to go. Uh, and of course, remove it after the winter because it's gonna pull water and get ants and all kinds of things in there. So there's a citrus on the left with a little tree wrap and there's a sapodilla on the right with a tree wrap. That's the um, insulation. It's got insulation cut and then some zip ties holding it in place. So there's the, uh, the insulation. There it is on the sapodilla. Now what you also might notice right here is they put a little micro irrigation up on a, on a rebar. And that is to put water into the tree all throughout the night. And I'll show you why that is something that you would want to do. So in a grove, you can do that in a home. You can do that with a little irrigation head, but you're going to have to have water constantly throughout the night. So systems using water, mist, flood, we talked about that. And then irrigation, you have many types, high volume over tree. These are big sprinklers that are tall, high volume under tree, big sprinklers that are, um, shorter hitting the trunks, high volume in tree, they're actually all the way in by the trunk. And then micro sprinklers, ground and micro sprinklers in the tree 
That last picture we saw was a micro sprinkler in the tree. So cold protection with above ground irrigation system. Why does it work? I keep mentioning irrigation to protect your, your trees. So there's a couple things. You have the, the water coming out of the ground and the ground, when that happens, it gives off a little heat as it cools. So it's a little warmer, then it comes up, gives off a little heat as it cools to freezing. Uh, then as that cools and gives off a little heat, then when it freezes, it gives off even more heat, quite a bit of heat. So if you have water constantly going on the trunk of your little sapodilla in the leaves, as it turns from water to ice over and over and over, that little bit of heat will keep that insulated at 32. So if you have something that can withstand 32 to 31 degrees, then this will work. And you saw a lot of those ones that I showed you at the beginning that will work for them. So three key components to make this work. One, like I said, the plant must be able to survive about 32 degrees. Then you have to have 0.2 inches of, of water in an acre per hour. So you have to have that water coming and it must completely cover the plant surface that you want to save. So sometimes you can only get it on the trunk. If you save the trunk, that, that can save the tree. If you have enough to get it all over the tree, that works. You don't want a sprinkler going side to side that's going to hit a tree and then hit another tree, hit another tree. That's not really going to work. So here is um, some overhead irrigation on carambolas. See that bottom right just covered in ice, so that will survive. Here's some sugar apples covered in ice. Um, you see the date on there, it's 2010. So it's been a while, but that was that was homestead. So there's all the ice and that ice is protecting the um, trees. So what can happen if you get too much ice and the, it's gonna be too heavy for the branches and they can snap, but Snapping branches is probably better than just letting them die from, from freezing. So this is, I showed you high volume over tree. This is under tree. You see the little smaller heads. Uh, this is in tree. See the heads are actually up in the tree of these lychees. Then you have low volume micro sprinklers. So this has been proven to work on um, citrus. You see bottom left, and there you see it getting ready to work on a lychee, uh, some sapodillas top right, and then bottom sapodilla. And you see there's a wrap on that as well. That looks like the one similar to the one we showed you earlier. So here comes the freeze. Now you're prepared, you have your irrigation system ready to go, you have your wraps in place. When do you turn on the irrigation system? Well, if you have wind speeds at 10 miles per hour or less, then you're gonna put it on right about 35 or 37. Because you don't wait till it freezes and then you turn it on, you turn it on before. The temperature is going down, down, down. You hit that 37, click everything on. And then once it's on, do not turn it off until we get up to 40. Now, that's wind speeds 10 miles per hour or less. I told you if you get a lot of wind, this doesn't work so well. So wind speeds above 10 miles per hour, use caution. It may be better not to irrigate. For under tree and in tree systems, this may work better because the tree is going to protect it from that wind moving around. That wind combined with the water can hyper, uh, hyper cool everything. So throughout the night, you're gonna monitor temperatures. You're gonna be out there with, with your uh, thermometer. You're gonna look at cloud cover, because remember when the clouds go away, 
You can have a radiation freeze. Um, you're going to continue to watch the weather forecast. You're going to pay attention to the wind direction and speed. You want that speed to go down. Uh, you're going to watch your irrigation and you may have to repair a broken or clogged head. So this is not going to be fun if it's freezing and you get all wet. So I said this earlier, many times our freezing weather comes in twos. So you could get two nights of freezing weather. A lot of times you'll get uh, the evective freeze and then the radiation freeze. So use the internet. We talked about this. These are some different sites that are available. Here's some more, Weather Underground and Telecast. I told you about NOAA and FAWN. Those are both online. Uh, this is FAWN. There's the um, email or the address for FAWN. You can also just Google IFAS FAWN weather. And they have real-time tracking, and then they have these tools where they can, they can forecast as well. But don't just go by the tools. Be out there with your thermometer. So the freeze is gone. It's happened. So what are the symptoms that you're going to see afterwards? Well, you're going to see some leaf wilting, water soaking, browning, and even death. Dead leaves hanging on the stems. Leaf drop. If you get leaf drop, that's a good thing because the plant means the stems are still alive and it's actively cleaning itself up and getting ready to put out new leaves. So leaf drop is better than these other things. Uh, and then flowers and fruit, water soaking, fruit may drop, may brown, may shrivel. So here's an avocado, top left. There's a carambola, top right. Carambola fruit, if you look down at the bottom of the fruit on the bottom right picture, you see that water soaking here. That's uh, damage from cold. Here's a carambola that has some leaves down below, but all the leaves up above died. So this is in good shape. It's still going to make it. So there's that um, tree that snapped. Looks like a lychee to me from the weight. Here's bananas that were just completely browned from the, the cold. But if you get in there, chop those down, chop them up, make them into mulch, the corms down below are going to push out new, new stalks. So the wood, twig, limb, and trunk discoloration, water soaking, browning, uh, trunk area, major limbs get splitting, sap coming out, and you may get sections that die. Usually the trunk is going to do better than the branches. So what do you do post-freeze tree care? Well, don't prune. Don't prune. Wait two to six months before you prune because you can't tell what's dead right after a freeze. There may be another freeze, and those things that are dead on top can protect and provide a barrier to heat loss. So you want to just leave them there. And if you do prune immediately after the freeze, you don't remove all the dead wood and you'll have to prune again later. So wait two to six months, then you can get a good look. And then when you do it, prune all the way back to live wood. Don't leave the dead wood, don't leave the little stubs. What about irrigation? It depends. If your trees got hammered and they're in bad shape, then uh, you're not gonna water much at all. Groves or trees with little damage should be irrigated normally. Groves or trees with moderate leaf damage uh, should be adjusted to about half. And then, of course, if you're heavy damage, you don't water as much because um, they need the leaves to take up the water. So if you're just watering, you're going to rot those roots. Same thing with fertilization, same idea. If they did great, then you stick it normal. If they did kind of in the middle, you cut it in half, um, and then if they did really bad, you're going to do very reduced rate. So final recommendations. 
be prepared by mid-November. That's why we're having this nice and early, this, this um, class. Monitor the weather nationally, regionally, locally, in your grove, and good luck. Don't forget, we have Tropical Fruit Tuesday's Tools of the Trade on October 24th. This is a brand new one. It's going to be a quite a task to put this PowerPoint together because it doesn't exist. Um, but uh, I'm excited about it because I do love tools. We'll be sharpening and cleaning and things like that. And then all about avocados, November 21st. And I'm going to put in the chat a link to a survey if you could fill out that survey it's also here you can use your smartphone put it on your camera point it at that qr code a link will come up you can do it on your phone it'll take two to three minutes or you can just if you're old school like me you can just click on the link in the chat and that will work as well